Good morning, Diversity Church. What's up, everybody? Hey, let me just get uh, the elephant in the room out the way. My eye is swollen. My wife punched me straight in my eye when I told her that I didn't like that dress. And she gave me a good left hand right to my eye, and it was like, oh, babe. No, she did not. Um, I actually had some type of sty or something. There's like an affection in there. Pray for me because uh, this morning it was all swollen and uh, puffy and stuff. But hey, I'm still going to preach. I'm not going to let a puffy eye keep me from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Um, so I do want to welcome those who are watching online. To everybody in this building, my name is Pastor Jonathan Ember. I'm the lead and founding pastor of Diversity Church. We're grateful that you came to worship with us. Wasn't our worship this morning just incredible? Come on, somebody. That worship was amazing. Just lifting up Jesus Christ, man. And that's what this church is all about. This is really why we started this series and why this is really the sixth week in this series called Organized Religion. We wanted to talk about what pure religion was, why to have church and how to do church right. And, and, and when we really do church right, we lift up the name of Jesus above all, anything else, above anyone else, above any other name. Come on, somebody. Jesus Christ still needs to be worshiped and we still are, are needing to organize around his name and around his church. And so we've been talking about that. This is the sixth week. I normally only preach four or five weeks in a series, but I really felt like we just needed to um, tackle this subject of why church is still important, okay? And so I want to just continue this series today with a message called Church Perks. Church perks. Um, it seems like every business nowadays has one of those perks cards. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like if you frequent that business and you do that so often, they give you some type of perk or reward or something like that. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys use these? I know that my wife does at Starbucks. The star rewards at Starbucks does save me some cash every once in a while because she does get some free coffee every once in a while because she frequents Starbucks so often. These businesses do this because they're trying to get people to come and, and, and stay there. They don't want you to go and get other coffee. And so they said, listen, if you keep coming to Starbucks, you're going to get perks, right? And if you keep getting perks, then we're going to give you like different coffee and different rewards and that type of thing. And so businesses do that so that f customers will frequent their business. Can I tell you something? God's business, the church, is no different than that. He wants to give people some perks when you frequent his house called the Church of the Living God. Now, I'm not going to just get cards out and um, every six Sunday you get a free donut if you come to church six Sundays in a row, you know? <laughs> if you come to church six Sundays in a row, you're going to get premium parking in our parking lot, you know? So we're not going to have a card that you have to stamp every time. But I want you to know that this thing called church, and when we organize around it and when we frequent it, there are some benefits. There are some perks that God has actually designed for us to enjoy when we actually frequent his house. Come on, somebody. It's not something that I give you. It's something that he gives you. And one of those perks, you guys might have known this, this, one of the perks of frequenting church is actually um, there's benefits to your health. Did you guys know that there's health benefits, like literal benefits for your body when you frequent church? Studies show that health perks, including better sleep, lower blood pressure, boosted immune system, and even longer lifespan is connected to regular church attendance. And you just thought it was the pastor that wanted you to be in there to boost your numbers. No, really, studies show that when you frequent church, that there are actually benefits to your health. And that's not to mention all the spiritual and emotional perks there are when you come to church regularly. And I'm going to talk about some of those today. But that kind of makes sense, right? If Jesus organized the church, and if you look at the New, the New Testament church in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, they frequent in church and they came and they gathered together on a Sunday morning. See, in the Old Testament it was Saturday, and that was because that was the Jewish Sabbath. But in the New Testament, they, they worshiped on the same day that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday morning. And that's the reason why we come and we gather just like they did, and we organize not just on Sunday, but even throughout the week to make a difference in this lost and hurting and desperate world that we live in. That's why we organize, and when we do it, there's a benefit to it, and that's why Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, talks about it like this. I want you to follow along with me on the screen or in your Bible, and it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love 
and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, that's church, as in the manner of some is, meaning some people have forsaken church, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There are some benefits and there's some perks to frequenting church that I want to talk about right from this portion of scripture. So let me give you three perks of frequenting church. I kind of like the way that sounds, don't you? Three perks of frequenting church. Let me give you the first one. First perk that we can find right here in Hebrews, if we frequent church, one of the things that we're going to get is our purpose. Purpose. Purpose is a perk of frequenting church, and you get to find your purpose You discover your purpose when you frequent church and you activate and you begin to activate your purpose when you frequent church. And notice the word frequent that I'm talking about. I got to let you guys understand this. There is a frequency that we should have in church attendance. And the reason why is not so you get spiritual brownie points and you get to go to heaven one day because you were a good church attender. No, because whatever you put into church is what you're going to get out of church. You can't think that, oh, I'll just casually do anything in life, any discipline that is worth, you know, a hill of beans, anything that's really worth doing, that means you actually got to do something and you got to do it regularly if you're going to get something out of that. How many guys know that that applies to diet and exercise? (laughs) Hey, I'm going to start this diet, (laughs) uh, but then I'll just do it once a week (laughs) or hey, I'll just do it once a month or hey, I'll just do it. No, it doesn't work like that. Discipline. And and regular discipline, and if you do something that's worth doing, you do it and you do it regularly, that's when you're going to get more out of it. The same thing is with church. A lot of people, you know, will just say, yeah, you know, I'll go whenever I feel like it or whatever. No, when you put in more to church, you're going to get more out of it. If you put in more to your marriage, you'll get more out of your marriage. If you put in more to your workplace, come on, you're going to get more out of your workplace because wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching with my little left eye being crazy. Come on, somebody. (laughs) And so what I'm talking about in this is your purpose, right? And if you actually frequent church and not just every once in a while come and all 10, no, when I actually put in more to church, I'm going to get more out of it. And one of those things I'm going to get out of it is finding, discovering, and activating my purpose and my potential. This is why in verse 24, it says uh, very clearly, let's consider one another to provoke, to love. And what is that? Good works. Like the works that God has destined for you to do like the thing that you were born to do, the thing that that you literally, when you were in your mother's womb and God had formed you and gave you gifts and talents and abilities and that type of thing, and he wrote your story and your destiny while you were there in your mother's womb, like that whole idea of coming to church, what happens is when you frequent him, what, what what will happen is you will get something activated on the inside of you called your potential, called your destiny, called your purpose, and that will help you then to live that out in the earth today through love and good works. That happens when we come into the body, and I, I've never seen anybody that was disconnected from a local church live out their potential and their mission from God in their life. I've never seen it. If you see somebody like that, please let me know, and then I, I'll do a whole study in their life just to try to figure out what's going on, because I've never seen it. Matter of fact, I've never seen anybody live a healthy Christian life outside of being a regular church attender and a healthy body of believers. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. And and, uh, matter of fact, I've actually seen the opposite. The opposite is true. What I see people when they are outside and separated from a healthy local body of believers is they get more selfish. They start working on things that really don't matter or that, that's not going to really last for eternity. Maybe they, they get more familiar with partying <laughs> and doing things, you know, like, oh, they don't have to go to church on Sunday, so I'm going to be out on Saturday. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I've seen a lot of that, but I've also seen people that, man, are really hungry after God, and they practice this discipline of frequenting church Man, what will happen over time is they'll start to hunger and thirst after righteousness in a different way. They'll start to hunger and thirst after their calling and their destiny and their purpose. And one of the reasons why is because when you're a part of a local church, God has ordained leaders in that church called the fivefold ministry, which we're going to look at in Ephesians chapter four, to help equip you 
and call certain things out in you to fulfill your destiny and purpose on the earth. You guys might not have known that. God has literally organized church in such a way that he has done this. I want you to read with me in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. It says, And he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, that's the people of God, for the what? Work of the ministry for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. You guys might not have known this, but you're called to do the work of the ministry. You actually have a destiny both inside the church, the local body of believers to edify and build them up, but also outside the church and what God's calling you to do to reach more people and win souls and make disciples. Like that's all of our destiny, but each one of us need to live that out in a specific way and we all have a specific calling. When you're a part of a healthy body of believers, God has ordained certain leadership in that church to help equip you and to provoke you to the loving good works that God is destined for you to do when you were in your mother's womb. Come on, somebody. That happens when you frequent church. Now, when I was in the church in Brazil, and I was a part of that ministry um, called Igreja Internacional de Graça de Deus, that is Portuguese for the International Church of the Grace of God, I was a part of that church in Brazil, and I was around a man named Dr. Suarez, who was really an apostle. If you look at those Ephesians 4, fivefold ministry giftings, he was an apostle, which really is a missionary type of gifting that goes and starts new works and plants churches and that type of thing. And when I was around that man and around that church, something that was inside of me was provoked something fiercely, and it was my destiny. It was my calling. And what we see today in Diversity Church after six years of of just following this call is a large part and, and is a result in large part to my time when I was in Brazil being under this man of God named Dr. Suarez and allowing his gifting from God to provoke my gifting his anointing from God to literally call out certain things on the inside of me that was there, that was dormant. And he literally just being there. There wasn't even anything outside of just some mentorship and things that he literally did to like do something. I was just being around there. I was absorbing what God had put on his life. And it was now calling out to something that God was putting into my life. When you frequent church, I'm telling you, what God has put in the leadership of that church is to literally call out something in you. It's to just move something in you. It's to provoke something in you, your purpose, your destiny, the reason why you're alive. And I'm telling you, when you find that purpose, I don't know if there's a better perk in your life than giving out of your purpose and destiny in your life. Come on, somebody. Isn't that good? Like if you've ever started to activate your potential and do something to make a difference in the world that we're living in, there is a perk, there's a, there's a desire, there's a pleasure, there's a, a blessing there that, that's not in almost anything else. And this is why in Acts 20, 35, Paul, or I think Paul is quoting Jesus here. Look at Acts 20, 35. It says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this. By the way, when you are under a certain minister, they show you certain things too. Talk about church perks. When you see an example of a real person of God, a man or woman of God, and you're out there, man, and you're just maybe accepting Christ, but you really don't know how to live or where to go or what to do or how to, how to do it and and maybe everything else in your life has, has told you only to live a certain way outside of God's plan. You're like, how do I do it? He says, I have shown you. When you've come to this church, man, and you've been under this ministry and you've been under my wife and myself, we just are wanting to show somebody how to live a godly life in this crazy age that we live in. We're just trying to let somebody know that there is a way, there is a truth, there is a life. His name is Jesus, and I just want to follow him in my character. I want to follow him in the way I love my wife. I want to follow him in the way I parent my daughter. I want to follow him in how I preach that gospel. And I want you guys to see that example that Paul's saying right here. He says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Here it is. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We're talking about church perks today. There is 
no greater, maybe the, one of the greatest I can say, but maybe even no greater perks in your life is giving out of your calling. When you start to live out your potential and you start to give to people in need and you start to show the gospel in a real way, I'm telling you about a perk that is more blessed than any other perk in your life. You are more blessed when you give out of your calling, when you give out of your potential, when you give what God has put in you. And when you come to church regularly, you're going to be provoked. How many guys can say honestly, who's been to diversity church for a long time, that you've been provoked to do certain things that you may have never done in your life before because you were part of this ministry? I got hands up all over this building. That happens when you frequent a healthy church under healthy leaders who are showing you the way of the gospel and provoking your destiny and your purpose inside of you. Come on, somebody, that's a perk for frequenting church. And so we should do that. And we should understand when we come regularly, that's going to happen in us. That's one of the reasons why in our membership class, we, we take everyone through a gift assessment. We want you guys to know how God's gifted you and ways you can serve again inside the church and outside of that church in your calling. And so again, this is our heart. We want to help equip you. We want to help provoke you to love and good works. Here's the second church perk that I want to talk about. The second church perk uh, that we find in this portion of scripture is relationships. So we got purpose. We also have relationships. Relationships are a phenomenal perk of frequenting church. Sometimes they could also be a phenomenal, not a perk, <laughs> a challenge. That's why I already preached a message uh, three or four weeks ago called Church Hurt. Because the same thing that could be one of the greatest blessings in your life can also be one of the greatest challenges in your life, and that's people, that's relationship. So I already talked about how if you've had negative examples of relationship or connections in church, how to go about that in my church hurt message. But here I'm going to tell you all the benefits and the blessing and, the, and the, the good that can come along with real relationships. See, real relationships is what church is really all about. In verse 25, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And what that means is church, because the word church literally means the gathering of God's people. So let me just tell you something. You can't have church by yourself in your living room. You can't. Because church is a gathering. <laughs> So a lot of disenfranchised Christians might say, you know what? I'm just going to watch church on television. I'm just going to watch the broadcast. And listen, we believe in broadcasting and that type of thing, but we really believe more of the broadcast of the church for the unbeliever than we do for the believer. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Why? Because that ain't church. That might be evangelism. And this is the reason why we broadcast our service. And maybe if you're on vacation or whatever, you want to join in on the service online. There's nothing wrong with that. My point is, is what we understand as church in the New Testament is gathering. It's bringing people together in the name of Jesus. You can't just do that watching, you know, Benny Hinn or Joel Osteen on TV in your living room. All right. You can't do it. You need to come and gather with God's people to really have real church. And that's why the Bible says, don't forsake that assembling, because when you come together, there's some real relationships there. I wanted to share with you a cartoon that I just got tickled by when I saw it the first time. And I might have actually seen it, I think, on Facebook. And I want you just to look at this picture on the screen with me today. This picture is a picture of people standing. Maybe that's St. Peter or, or Jesus. I don't know who it is. But uh, this is obviously at the gates of heaven. And it says, and you who did not actually go to church, but watch it on television, you will not actually go into heaven, but will be allowed to watch it on television. <laughs> Oh, I just thought that was hilarious. Okay, let me tell you, frequenting church will not get you into heaven, but what it will do is get you into divine relationships. Frequenting church doesn't get you into heaven, but it does get you into divine, to divine relationships. Okay, so God wants you to understand, okay, the way we get to, into heaven is by the finished work of Jesus and by his shed blood. And that's what we sang about so beautifully this morning when we were just worshiping God for his amazing grace. That's how we get to heaven. 
But when we come to church and we actually start living out some of the disciplines that Jesus called us to, which is gathering, and that's obviously what the writing, writer of Hebrews is talking about, what will happen is some benefits and perks in our life. And one of those things is relationships, divine connections. And one of those relationships that builds when you frequent church is actually your relationship with God, believe it or not. Now, can I tell you something? You can have a relationship with God and not go to church. I gotta let everybody know this. I'm not trying to preach something that is not in the Bible. You can actually love God, be on your way to heaven, and not be in church. You you really can, okay? I've never seen a healthy Christian do that, but you can still be a Christian and go to heaven, okay? But your relationship with God grows in a different way when you gather with his people on Sunday, also in your cell groups, and any other gathering, the dudes and the daughters meetings, and any other meeting that we have. There's something about coming to a place like this. Even the building in this building is something special because it's been here for 102, I think 103 years, proclaiming the same gospel that's been proclaimed for 2,000 years with (laughs) believers gathering in these same pews that you're sitting in for 103 years. And you see the stained glass and and just the, the history and the, And just the the way the building just tells a story all in itself. And you come in and just by walking in this place, you feel something. You have a, a certain expectation. But maybe it's even other meetings that we have where like you're actually going somewhere and doing something. Like you can work out at home. How many of you guys know that when you go to the gym, you work out a little bit better? You work out a little bit harder. Come on, somebody. You guys know what I'm saying. When we come to church... There's something different about being a part of the gathering. There's something different, man. There's there's something that happens in here. And one of the things is, is it's like when you hear somebody else's revelation of Jesus and what God's doing in their life, it helps you see Jesus better in your life. I want you to think about this. Like the Bible says in Matthew 18, 20, Look at this, Matthew 18, 20. You may have never thought of it like this, but Jesus is saying, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. What we normally think of is he's there just as a ghost, just hanging out with us. But I want you to think about the revelation of Jesus that happens when two or three or a gathering of 100 or 200 come together and somebody is sharing about this Jesus who has changed their life and is changing their life and is speaking to their life and is ministering to their life. Like when you hear them do that and say that, you see Jesus in a different way than you would ever see him on your own. Guys, you can have a relationship with me and you'll get to know me in a certain way. But if you get to know Nicole, and you build a relationship with her, there's something about me that you will only understand by her testimony. (laughs) Like if you get to know her and then she tells you certain things, like I could tell you it, but you're like, eh, I don't know about that. But if she says it about me, then all of a sudden there's there's a little more depth to that. There's a little bit more clarity maybe you get. That's what I'm trying to say. When you come and gather with God's people, there's a clarity you get of God and his son, Jesus Christ, that you will never get on your own. And so it builds your relationship with him because you'll begin to see Jesus in the midst of the church, in the midst of the gathering, in the midst of the two or three or the hundred or two hundred that you will never see on your own. I believe in church, somebody. Come on, somebody. I believe in this thing. It's changed me time and time again. I get provoked by Nina's relationship with God. I get provoked by Miss Shauna's relationship with God. I get provoked by seeing people like the Conrads or, or Jerry or any of these other people that are following Jesus like in the beginning and, and just maybe for the first time. And something is so provocative about coming and seeing God work in their lives. And it challenges me and makes me see Jesus more in my life. Come on, that's good, right? That's, again, why we gather, and it's a perk, relationships. Another relationship that is, again, uh, affected is just our relationship with anybody that we meet and connect with in church or through church. I want you to think about this. The Bible says in Genesis 2.18, man is not meant to be alone. God said this to Adam. It is not good 
for man, that's people in general, to be alone. So at the beginning, God ordained a family, a true family, a husband and a wife and then the kids, and that was supposed to be their community. And that was the first institution God ever created. Come on, before government, before the nation of Israel, and before the church, he destined family. Well, now with families being so broken and and a society that is so broken and relationships are like on the rare, like healthy, good relationships are on the rare. In our day and age, I don't think that the church could be more important (laughs) than for this area of somebody's life in this realm of relationships. People need it. It's not good for us to be alone. It's not right. And in your relationship with God, I'm telling you, it's not good for you to be alone. And so God has created you to come and meet some people in this place that God has literally ordained for your life to help connect you deeper to him and to each other and just to be there, a shoulder to cry on, somebody to lean on, somebody to help bear your burden and you bear theirs. Come on, you guys know what it's like in this life and how hard it can be. We need each other in this place. And and so it's not good for us to be alone. As I was thinking about church perks and I was thinking about relationships, I was wanting to think about through the years of this church, six years now, next week, we're celebrating our anniversary, six years. All right, I was thinking about some of the cool things of the perks of relationships. In the very first year of our church, uh, my wife's sister, who's my sister-in-law, actually met her husband, Anthony, in Diversity Church. Talk about church perks, come on, somebody. She found herself a husband, okay? Now, some of you guys are like, the single people in here are like, oh, hey, um, this is a place for that? (laughs) Okay, it's not just for that, and don't be a creep, you know, trying to... (laughs) Church perks, you you heard what pastor said. (laughs) Uh, All right? But I want you to think about it. Like, that could be a good place to meet somebody, right? doesn't mean that you will or that it's the best place or whatever or the only place. I'm just saying, that was a perk because somebody found their life partner in the household of God. Now, whether that's your romantic partner or not, I'm telling you, there are life partners that you will meet in the house of God that are helping you and will help you provoke you also to love and good works, not just the pastor, not just the leader of the church, but also the people of the church. Can I tell you something? Studies, as I was studying some of those church perks that I was mentioning in the beginning of our, of our personal health, one of the other things that I saw, another relationship or relationships that can be impacted by church is your family relationships, even your marriage, even your marriage. Studies also show couples who go to church together have a higher sense of happiness and satisfaction in their marriage. Now, some of you guys are like, man, uh, that's not true in my relationship, Pastor. Well, maybe you should just keep on coming and, and, and figure it out. Or maybe you should just become a disciple of Jesus. And when he tells you to be more loving to your spouse and love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, not just being an attender in your marriage, not just being a recipient and sitting in the pews in your marriage, but actually get involved in your marriage the way we're supposed to be involved with Christ in his church. And maybe something will change in your relationship. Man, I should probably have a puffy eye every week when I'm preaching somebody. I'm here today to tell you that church is important for your relationships. It's important for your relationships. And so I want you just to understand, like God wants you to come and gather to affect every one of your relationships. That's what church will do. It's a perk of frequenting church. And let me give you the last, the third perk that I want to talk about. And it's not the last perk. I mean, I'm telling you, there were perks for your health that I mentioned, all sorts of things. Again, for frequenting church, here's another one though, encouragement. Encouragement. Encouragement is another perk of frequenting church. And we see that here in verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some people is but exhorting one another. And that word exhorting, another word for that is encouraging. All right? But encouraging or exhorting one another so much the more. So he's actually gonna give you an idea of, you should probably come to church more in this regard. So much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm gonna explain what that day approaching, what that really means. But I want you to see right here, we live in some dark and discouraging days. Whether we're thinking about this day that approaching or not, and I'm going to again explain that. But how many of you guys know that, like, and maybe you guys can testify, you've come to church one time and like it was just that Sunday that you felt like the preacher gave a word straight for you. You guys know what I'm talking about? You're going through something and man, boom, like 
was he, was he reading my mail? Like, he you know what was going on? You guys have been there, right? Um, there's something about, again, gathering and being encouraged when you come. Like, God wants to encourage you. God wants to exhort you, encourage you, strengthen you, put courage into your life when courage has been removed from your life, right? And so he's designed the body, both just on a Sunday morning worship gathering again or our cell groups or other ways that we gather. Just maybe you see somebody in the hall and you give them an encouraging word. Maybe you just haven't felt pretty and somebody just said, man, that, that dress or that, that outfit, man, that looks really good on you and just gave them a boost. That color looks really good on you. Gave you just a boost. There's something about getting encouraged, right, when we're having a bad day. Well, let me tell you something. There is no bad day worse than the day before this day that the Bible mentions right here, okay? When he's saying, as you see the day approaching, it's the day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you guys know that Jesus is coming back to fix this mess that we're in? Hallelujah, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come on, we need him to come back. But before that day of his return, the Bible mentions the last days in some ways that are like really concerning and can be extremely discouraging. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy 3, 14. I want to read this and we're going to be ending the message in uh, just a moment. But I just want you guys to think about this word here given in 2 Timothy 3, because I was thinking about it a couple of weeks ago when I was on uh, Facebook and I just felt like I just saw one bad report after one bad report. Some filth after some other filth. Some just grimy, nasty, ugly thing or some grimy, nasty, ugly story or some just thing. And it just was so discouraging. You guys ever get on Facebook or social media and feel discouraged after you're done? This is why we have a love-hate relationship, man, because sometimes it is encouraging. And other times we're like, God, why am I even on here? You know what I'm saying? Well, this is the way I felt this day because this verse came to my, or these verses came to my mind when I was looking at this and I even posted about it. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4 says this, but know this, that in the last days, everybody say last days. Last days. So Hebrews was talking about, as you see the day approaching, Jesus' return before that day and the days we're in right now are called the last days, okay? So he says, you know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, let me give you the definition of perilous, and I think Audrey's going to have to uh, jump to another screen to show you this. This word perilous literally means hard to bear, fiercely difficult to cope with because it's so harsh and even injurious. Injurious. Perilous. Difficult and hard to bear, fiercely difficult to cope with. You guys ever feel that way in your life? Like some bad days, man. We've all had those bad days, and maybe you're living right now in some of those bad days. You feel like, how am I going to even get on with my life? How am I going to keep on keeping on? I don't know if I can bear this anymore. Hard to bear, fiercely difficult to cope with, so harsh, even to the point where it's like causing you injury. The day we live in with depression and anxiety on the rise. Have you guys noticed that? Depression and anxiety, it's just on the rise. There's more mental health issues in our day maybe than ever before. Maybe because we're living in these perilous days, these last days that the Bible talks about. And maybe that's why we should come to church and organize around God's body that much more in these days. Because there's encouragement in God's house. There's encouragement in God's house. Let's finish reading in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4. It says, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. You want to know the issue in marriage? The number one issue is that you're a lover of yourself and you're seeking your own needs more than your spouse's needs. You want to know the problem in church is when pastors or church members and Christians seek their own needs more than somebody else's needs. Perilous times will come from men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Want to know the issues in church? <laughs> Other issues when pastors or people are more lovers of money more than lovers of God. Boasters. 
one of the issues in church and issues in the world, people's pride and arrogance, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Guys, man, we live in a day and age where people say Jesus Christ like a curse word every other sentence it seems like or uses God's name in vain and just runs his name, this beautiful name that's given us life and breath through the, through the mud. And, and we just see this, I mean, everywhere it seems. Disobedient to parents. I know that we're living the last days. <laughs> I know it, man. The way people are talking to their parents, man, don't get me tripping right now. Okay. Unthankful unholy. Have you guys felt this? This is the stuff we live in and live around every day of our life. Unholy. Look at the next verse. Verse three. It says unloving, unforgiving. One of the issues in marriage and in church, when you hold on to unforgiveness and you become bitter. Slanderers without self-control. Guys, what I was just talking about Facebook, how many of us just are mindlessly, without control, spending hours and hours and hours? Man, I'm meddling right now. <laughs> Despisers of good. Y'all, we live in a day and age where people call good evil and evil good. I see it everywhere, all around me. And it's so heavy to bear. Perilous times will come. Because it's like, man, God, I just live here and I'm supposed to live and be in this world, but not of it. But I feel like every day this world is just bringing me down. You guys know what I'm talking about. So the scripture is just sharing with you all these things without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, Haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. This is the day we're living in, y'all. And because of it, because this is real in the earth today, we get discouraged. We get our courage. If we had an, an account and it was full of courage, living in this world just takes out courage from our account. And that's what the word discouraged means. We're here, and I feel like, man, I, I need to keep on. I need to do the things that God's called me to do. I need to have courage in the face of all this, but it's just so discouraging. Well, here's the anecdote. Here's the perk for your life. Come to the body of Christ, where good news is preached, and we're encouraging one another that, listen, with God, all things are possible. You can get through it. You can do it. The Bible says with Jesus, come on, somebody, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, who gives me courage to keep on keeping on when I feel like giving up, when I feel like ending my marriage, when I feel like quitting my job, when I feel like stopping, uh, stopping uh, going to church and that type of thing. God says, no, with him. Him. You need this even more. The more you see this stuff in the world, it says even so much, the more as you see the day approaching of Christ's return, because it's only going to get darker and darker. But here's the good news. The church can get brighter and brighter. <laughs> and to those people who've given up on organized religion, in this dark day, if we'll be an encouraging body of believers, full of love and good works, all these things that I'm talking about, full of relationship, we will show a world that's given up on organized religion that this is the best place to be in our day and age. Why don't you bow your heads and close. Thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm John Collier, and I hope today has inspired you to love God and to love others more. We always wanna take some time at the end to pray for you, especially if this is the first time of believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and raise again so that he can be king and we don't have to be. Help us to learn more about you so we can live more like you. <laughs> We want you to connect with us and we want to connect with you. You can comment down below or go to diversitychurch.net and we'll see you again next week.